Good morning, I'm Rose Lee. Today we're going to discover why work life has changed with one in four Americans working remotely. And don't cancel your travel plans yet. You're going to learn about Dean Brain Stimulator Implant's new technology and health coverage tips for 2022. And the key to preventative medicine is annual wellness checkups. All when we return. According to Upwork's Future of Workforce Pulse report in 2021, one in four Americans are working remotely. By 2025, 36.2 million Americans will work remotely. That's an 87% increase from pre-pandemic levels. The American Enterprise Institute revealed pandemic remote working skyrocketed from 7% of the work population in March 2020 to nearly 40% at the height of the pandemic. Most offices are open in Florida, but it looks like the hybrid work model is here to stay. Joining us this morning to explain how you can integrate products into your work routine that facilitate productivity from anywhere is Amy Lang, a hybrid worker and senior vice president of marketing and strategy at Staples U.S. Retail. Good morning, Amy. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Amy, you earned an MBA from Harvard and worked in many positions at Staples, from store operations to sales operations, and led the print merchandising team. I'm sure you brought work home. So what do you see as the future of the workplace today? Yeah, you know, the, the future of the workplace really is being wherever you want to be. It's all about flexibility. And, you know, the last couple of years during the pandemic, we've really learned how to work productively remote. And I think prior to that, you know, I did bring work home sometimes and it wasn't always productive because I didn't bring home the right things and I didn't have the right tools. Well, all of that has changed. You know, the pandemic really has um, created this whole new enterprise around productivity tools on the go. And so there's lots more options now for folks, but working wherever you want to be, that is the future of work. You know, employees have really learned to appreciate the ability to have some control over their lives. You know, I'm allowed now to kind of go to my daughter's dance classes. I can be productive while I'm sitting waiting and watching her do her dance class. I can go to their parent-teacher conferences. Those were things I really couldn't do before because I was in the office all the time. And that flexibility is something that a lot of folks aren't going to give up easily. <laughs> Amy, share some solutions for those working with hybrid work models or working on the go. Hybrid is a whole new set of challenges. You know, and I just recently in the last couple months have started going to the office two days a week. And I even did some work travel recently. So I was in an airport. Well, how do I make sure that I bring everything I need with me there? So there's lots of, again, great tools that are on the market. One of them that I particularly love is this, it's called a mobile workstation. It's a very slim briefcase and you put everything in it that you need. So I actually keep my notebook and pens in there. I have a ring light and I just put my computer in. And when I'm on the go, I open it up and I work directly in it. So I'm not packing and unpacking and risking forgetting something. So that's one just simple, great tool. Another really great tool that I'm using a lot now is this foldable keyboard. So I mentioned that I go to my daughter's dance class twice a week. So I'm sitting there for an hour. I can't bring my laptop because there's not a spot for me to put it, but I bring my phone and I bring this and I can be super productive and I can reply to emails while I'm sitting there, you know, longer emails than I would typically do on my phone. So those are just two great examples of, of things that folks can use. And there are tons more tools like that that are on the market now as people are figuring out hybrid work. Flexibility is the key, Amy. So what about small businesses and entrepreneurs? What are some tips to help them set up their home office for success? Yeah. So the vast majority of small businesses start in their homes. So their challenges are very similar to a remote worker in terms of finding a space and being productive um, and really having the right tools. But small businesses have additional challenges, which is taking payment and marketing. So some of the great tools that are now available, we offer the Sum Up Plus Reader. This is a great tool for small businesses. It's a remote um it's a remote card reader, so you can have customers pay with chip, pin, swipe, whatever they want. Very low cost way for a small business to take payment. Another great tool for them is a vlogger kit. So we offer the Tazumi vlogger kit. It's a stand with a light and a microphone. And so a small business in their kitchen can actually produce a very high quality digital marketing ad that they can put on Facebook. And so just having those kinds of tools now readily available to a small business, they can be in their garage, they can be working out of a coffee shop, but they can look like a big business and they can operate like a big business. All right, Amy, 
What key takeaways should we know about the future of our work model and the needs of our workers? The future is here and remote work is really here to stay. Hybrid work is here to stay. So I would say for employees, embrace this. You know, we have an opportunity now to really reset work and life balance and find new patterns for how we work. You know, if you want to be able to work early in the morning, work late at night and use part of the day to do other things, there's now actually flexibility for us to do that. And there's lots of tools that we can use to stay productive no matter where you are. And for companies, you know, really they're starting to embrace allowing their employees to do that. And that's great because that's going to drive retention of employees and employee morale. And there's tons of great tools out there to help all of this happen. So we don't have to slog through it. So check out staplesconnect.com for great ideas. Go to a Staples store. There are so many products that can really make you productive and really drive success. Thank you, Amy, for joining us to give us a better perspective on the changing model of the workplace and the tools that we need for success. Thank you for having me. The holiday season is an exciting time of the year, though for people living with overactive bladder, it'll cause more stress and anxiety about visiting family or friends, traveling, and even avoiding certain holiday meals. According to the American Urological Association, 46 million Americans 40 years of age or older reported symptoms of overactive bladder. So if you're living with an overactive bladder, don't cancel your travel plans yet. Joining us this morning with advice on how to help manage the common condition is Diane Newman, nurse practitioner with over 30 years experience specializing in urology and the spokesperson for Eurovance Sciences. Good morning, Diane. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Diane, as an author of several books on managing and treating urinary incontinence, tell us what causes an overactive bladder. Well, you know, as you mentioned, overactive bladder is more common than we think. Um, it affects one in 10 Americans. And what happens is that um, they restrict their travel, and this is a holiday season. Um, they're embarrassed, and a lot of them think it's a normal part of aging, but it's not. Individuals with overactive bladder have symptoms of urinary urgency, which is intense desire to go to the bathroom. They also have frequent urination, which is going to the bathroom more than eight times in a day. And they may also have leaking episodes, which is urinary incontinence, where they uh, lose urine involuntarily when they don't want to after urinary urgency. Holidays can be difficult for people with overactive bladder. So what are some of the most common complaints you hear? Well, you know, you're right about the holiday season. What I hear is that, you know, people don't want to go travel. They don't want to be in the car if they have urgency occur. Uh, they don't want to get on a plane because maybe they're afraid of using the plane bathroom, that type of thing. So it can be a real problem. But, you know, a cause of overactive bladder is when that bladder muscle contracts involuntarily, and that can lead to these symptoms. So, you know, if you have this problem, you want to seek help. Um, because there's many things that do help overactive bladder. Diane, share some techniques to help manage symptoms. You know, there's a few things that you can try. First of all, if you're going on a long trip, um, map out your trip. Maybe for every two to four hours, stop, go urinate, so that you decrease that strain on your bladder so you don't worry about, say, urinary urgency. Um, a lot of people restrict their fluids. You shouldn't. Um, you should drink normally, but maybe cut down on the fluids a couple hours before you leave your house, okay, before you start to travel. There's also certain foods that irritate the bladder. And if you can identify anything in your diet that might be irritating your bladder, causing those OEB symptoms like uh, maybe caffeine, coffee and tea, uh, maybe cut back a little bit on that, also spicy foods. And then you should see your doctor, your healthcare provider, because there's other treatments such as bladder training, um, ways to control urinary urgency, and also pelvic floor muscle training. So what triggers an overactive bladder to react to certain foods or drinking holiday cocktails? Well, what happens is that, you know, that bladder contracts and you're not aware of what's going to happen and that can lead to urgencies. And there's also other approaches, which is why I'm partnering with uh, your advanced sciences. Um, they have a medication called Gemtessa, 5 and 75 milligrams that you take once a day. 
You can take it with a glass of water. Um, you can um, also take it with or without food. You can also crush it if you want to and put it in applesauce and take it with maybe a glass of water. It has no significant impact on the blood pressure and it's been shown to help overactive bladder symptoms. Now, like all medications, it does have some side effects, including headache, uh, uh, common cold symptoms, uh, diarrhea, nausea, and upper respiratory urinary tract infection. Um, so this medication can help you. So it may not be right for everyone, so that's why I really advise you to go see your healthcare provider or talk with your doctor about your overactive bladder symptoms. All right, so what's your best advice you can share before seeing your doctor? Do a bladder diary. It's almost like a food diary. Write down, like, when you go to the bathroom, what are you drinking, um, if you have any urgency, if you have any incontinence, and take that to your doctor on the first visit and say, these are what's happening to me, these are what's bothering me. Rosalie, I, I suggest, too, that you do an elimination diet, because sometimes my patients will say to me, well, Diane, you took away everything I like, because I give them a list of things that can irritate the bladder. I don't want to do that, because, you know, hey, I like to have my tea every morning. What you want to do is look at your diet, write it down, and see what, if you take something away, like cut down on, instead of three cups of coffee, maybe one cup, and see if that improves your overactive bladder symptoms. These sound simple, but I cannot tell you how effective they can be in really helping your bladder. You can also go to gemtessa.com to learn more information about OAB and also about medication. Thank you so much, Diane, for your expert advice on how to manage an overactive bladder so you can enjoy the holiday season. Thank you so much for having me. Infinity Healthcare Group has over 50 years of experience in primary care with two locations in Broward County. Joining us this morning to discuss the importance of preventive medicine to achieve a healthier lifestyle is the CEO of Infinity Healthcare, Joseph DeCapua. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning, Rosalie. Joseph, tell us, what is preventive medicine? Preventive medicine is a team approach. Patient and their primary care physician taking a proactive approach to one's health. Preventive medicine also helps in identifying early stage diseases. The goal of preventive medicine is to promote a healthy and sustainable lifestyle. Preventive medicine is also the foundation of primary care. Now we know what preventive medicine is, what is a preventive medicine scorecard? Well, HEDIS is the healthcare effectiveness data and information set. It's one of the healthcare's most widely used performance improvement tools. 191 million people Half of the U.S. are enrolled in plans that report HEDIS results. Now, HEDIS measures performance in healthcare, where improvements can make a meaningful difference in a patient's lives and well-being. HEDIS is a rating system that uses many different specific measures or standards to compare the performance and care of most health plans in the U.S. The ratings are performed each year and cover an extremely broad range of issues affecting health plans. Do most patients even realize the scope of health care? To most people, health is the absence of disease. The real aim of preventive medicine is to achieve a sustainable, healthy lifestyle, disease-free, and identify any disease in its early stages. Healthy people are not health conscious or aware of their need to be free of disease, and therefore it is difficult for a majority to realize the value of preventive medicine. Most patients are non-compliant and do not follow up on their preventive measures and annual screening recommendations, as well as their following up on their appointments. Approximately over a 12-month period, 68% are classified as non-compliant, which is undoubtedly a huge concern. Tell us what you mean by proactive prevention. Proactive prevention of disease is a function of both the primary care physician and the individual working together to ensure the individual stays healthy and has a good quality of life. Also, to identify the beginning of a disease, example, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, early detection increases the chances of a complete cure or a maintenance program for the individual patient. What are some challenges in preventive medicine? 
The challenges are motivating the individual to practice his or her own prevention. Staying with one physician who knows your history. Keeping appointments with your primary care physician. Scheduling an annual wellness exam at the beginning of each year, which is very important. The annual physical examination is an excellent opportunity for the primary care physician to begin education in certain basic areas, such as the need for exercise, nutrition, diabetic diet, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. All right, Joseph, what is the key to preventive medicine? The key to modern preventive medicine is a motivated patient who is willing to comply with the HEDIS requirements which ensures a healthy lifestyle. The patient must learn discipline and self-motivation. The primary care physician must assist the patient in these efforts, making for a team effort. The earlier the disease is identified, the greater the opportunity to reduce the risk and cure the disease. To learn more on how to achieve a greater quality of health, through preventive medicine, contact us at Infinity Healthcare Group in Broward at 954-586-8058. And please remember, January 1st is coming. You need to schedule your annual wellness exam. It is so important. It is the baseline of your health. Thank you, Joseph, for joining us this morning to help viewers better understand preventive medicine as a proactive team effort between patient and their doctor to gain a healthier lifestyle. Rosie, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss preventive medicine. If you're one of the over 4 million Floridians, 65 years old or older, this is the time of year during Medicare open enrollment period to choose a Medicare plan that fits your needs. Or if you like your current plan, call to see if there are any changes. Choosing a Medicare plan is one of the most important decisions a person can make not only for their health and well-being, but also for their wallet. Joining us to share important health coverage information and tips on how to make the best choices when it comes to Medicare coverage is Chief Medical Officer at United Healthcare, Medicare, and Retirement, Dr. Philip Painter. Good morning, Dr. Painter. Good morning. Open enrollment period is a window of time once a year that offers those ready to turn 65 or older an opportunity to choose a Medicare plan they decide fits their needs. Doctor, tell us about the current Medicare annual enrollment season and why is it so important? We're, we're kind of at the, the home stretch for that enrollment period. It started October 15th and it ends December 7th. So coming up relatively soon. And it's really important because this is the time that people have a chance to make a change to their, to their Medicare coverage. And so it's really important that they look at that thoughtfully and do the right evaluation, because as you said, it can have an impact on their health and it can also have an impact on their finances for the coming year. So, so really important that they, they do a thoughtful look before they decide to change or choose a new plan. What advice can you share to help make the process of choosing a plan easier? You know, I would say first, look at your existing plan and does it still fit your needs? So have you had some change in your health? Have you had some other change in your lifestyle? Look at the coverage changes possibly on that plan. And, and if that plan still is a great fit, then you can stay with that. And, and that's relatively easy. But if it's not a fit, then I think reasonable to, to look at other options and see if there's better offerings out there that you can enroll in. For many people, choosing a plan can be really confusing. So what are the most important things to consider when enrolling in a Medicare plan? Well, well, you know, Rosalie, I, I like to break it down into, into three things that I think people should look at. The first is the coverage. The second is the cost. And the third is the access. So does the plan cover the basic things you need? And does it cover extra things like vision or hearing or dental or maybe even over-the-counter medicines? And then what's the cost? So what's the monthly premium? What are the co-pays or the co-insurance like? Does it have a maximum out of pocket? So the amount you can you can spend in a year, for example, original Medicare has no maximum that you can spend, but Medicare Advantage plans like United Healthcare do. 
And then lastly, access, which is really important. Is your doctor, is your preferred hospital in the network? Can you continue to go see them? Because that, that continue, you know, continuity is really important. So you want to make sure that your existing healthcare providers are in the network. And United Healthcare has the largest network across the country, uh, over a million providers that you can use with in-network fees. So all, all three really important, important aspects. So if you're a person who takes a number of prescription drugs or just one prescription drug a day, what factors should you consider when choosing a Medicare plan's prescription drug coverage? Yeah, really, really an important thing to look at. You know, original Medicare doesn't cover prescription drugs. So you have to have either a standalone Part D plan or you can get a Medicare Advantage plan that combines medical coverage and drug coverage all in one. And really important, you make sure your medicines are covered under the plan. You certainly don't want to have to change medicines um, if you don't have to. And then not only are those medicines covered, but what's the cost and what tier are they in? And can you get mail-in medicine? You know, that's a very convenient way to get maintenance medicines is through a pharmacy mail-in delivered to your home. You can get 90-day supply at, at no cost. And then lastly, is your pharmacy and or pharmacist in the network? Same thing as, as we were talking about with the physicians, all very important aspects when you're looking at a drug plan and, and coverage. All right, Dr. Painter, tell us, where can our viewers learn more about Medicare annual enrollment? Great site to go to, uhcmedicarehealthplans.com. Gives you a lot of information about Medicare in general, the plans that you can choose, allows you to compare and shop. So really think that's a nice site for people to go to to get a lot of information. Thank you, doctor, for joining us and helping to educate our viewers to choosing a Medicare plan that can improve their health and well-being and be kind to their wallets. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Most people living with chronic pain and movement disorders like Parkinson's disease travel far to visit their doctors for treatment relief using deep brain stimulator implants. Now, patients with these implants can use Neurosphere Virtual Clinic, a first of its kind technology which allows physicians to communicate remotely with patients using the new platform to adjust the stimulation device and regulate optimal settings to provide pain relief and tremor control while evaluating results in real time. Joining us to discuss the approved U.S. Food and Drug Administration Neurosphere Virtual Clinic is Dr. Juan Ramirez from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio and his patient Darren Wright, a patient with Parkinson's disease living near Dallas, who experienced a dramatic change in his quality of life using the new virtual technology. Good morning, doctor, and good morning, Darren. Good Hi morning. There. Dr. Ramirez, what has been the traditional method of treatment for those who suffer with chronic pain and movement disorders? So the traditional treatment for patients with chronic movement disorders, especially Parkinson's, it's oral medications. Um, these are pills that people take uh, in a specific schedule and uh, they're expected to control certain symptoms of the condition and they tend to be effective and uh, to some degree. However, uh, these conditions, especially Parkinson's, is a degenerative condition where uh, symptoms progress over time um, and then we fall into the situation where medications are just not enough even as we add uh, other meds or we increase the doses the effectiveness is just not as it used to be uh, furthermore uh, the complications of increasing doses usually bring um, uh, unwanted uh, side effects. Darren when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease what made you decide to get an implant to help control your conditions? Well, I was di diagnosed back in uh, 2014, um, and I jumped right in uh, to try to educate myself on the disease. I also joined, some, joined a support group in the area. I was actually in the San Antonio area at the time. And uh, so I had met people that had already had the uh, deep brain stimulation surgery and was able to talk to them and watch them. and, and uh, as my Parkinson's progressed, I finally got to the point where medicine wasn't working very well, so then I reached out to Dr. Ramirez and we started the process of uh, deep brain stimulation surgery, and I had that in March of 2019. Doctor, 
who is a good candidate for stimulation therapy? In order to determine if somebody is a good candidate for deep brain stimulation, they have to go through a process, a screening process, where we need to establish that their diagnosis is correct, that they respond um, uh, as expected to the medications, and that we have a baseline neurocognitive uh, assessment. Doctor, tell us, how has the Neurosphere Virtual Clinic changed how you help care for your patients' conditions? So once deep brain stimulation is in place, um, uh, the uh, historically the way that we would uh, do programming and adjustments would be with the patient being physically in clinic. Now with the Abbott Neurosphere Virtual Clinic, that uh, is not the case anymore. We are able to connect with patients remotely. That my patient can be at home, can be at work, and I'm able to interact with them through this platform. I can see them in the video. We can talk about how symptoms are. I can do an examination, and I can also check uh, their stimulator to make sure that the settings are where they're supposed to. They, I can check the integrity of the system. And once uh, we determine that, uh, based on that visit, that I need to do adjustments, uh, change any of the parameters of the stimulation, um, I can do it right there and uh, that translate into my patient getting those, uh, uh, those changes immediately. And um, as, as you could imagine, uh, doing this um, uh, can help me see more patients, see them more frequently and uh, without the inconvenience of people coming into the, the office. Darren, what are you able to do now using Neurosphere Virtual Clinic, and how has it helped you manage your treatment? Two years ago, I moved up to Dallas, and uh, but I wanted to remain with Dr. Ramirez, um, and uh, up until the point of them coming out with this, I was having to drive down here for appointments and things. So we're talking, you know, I'd have to typically take a day, a full day or day and a half off, uh, just to get that accomplished and get back home. Um, now, we can just do those visits right from my office. Uh, Dr. Ramirez can access my programmer, make adjustments where needed. Um, we do, it, uh, all the app is on my phone, so it's all one, one, basically one click, and then we get started. And so rather than, like I said, killing a day and a half, um, I'm able to get this done in 30, 45 minutes from home, from the office, wherever I need to be and uh, continue on with life without it taking so much time. Where can our viewers find more information? They can go to the website at abbott.com. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez and Darren, for joining us to discuss the new Neurosphere Virtual Clinic to connect patients with doctors remotely. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Technology continues to grow to keep us healthier and with greater independence in our personal life and work life. Share with us how technology offers you a greater quality of life at facebook.com forward slash Rosalie Show and follow us on Instagram at The Rosalie Show. Watch this episode and many others 24-7 at rosaliearchershow.com. Thanks for joining us this morning. We look forward to seeing you soon.